All right, let's go to Nick Wright. You guys are all banging on Oklahoma City. By the way, let me ask you, all you guys banging on Oklahoma City, would you rather have the Jets, Giants, job, or the Packers? Don't get too caught up in market size. What, what, what are we? I mean, I, SG... I'm just talking okay. about the fact that, okay. hi, Colin. Did you just say that the Warriors have the next Clay Thompson? You just threw that in as an aside? Pods. I know you like pods. I know who you're <laughs> talking about, buddy. I don't think the next Clay Thompson is on the board. Okay. I think he's a nice pick and a nice player. All right. So I was so, that was such a, an earthquake of a take just thrown in there as an aside <laughs> that it, I, it threw me off on the rest of it. I don't hate, it seems like J-Mac hates this list. I don't I don't hate the list. Is the, the, the problem is the Lakers not being right. on it to some, but if you go work for the Lakers, you work for a team that doesn't have real money and a front office who has proven time and again that they are only elite at one thing, keeping their positions of power, yeah. keeping their jobs. So I don't think it's I don't think the Lakers are a great job. And I think that the the Lakers front office, Colin, made, in my opinion, two massive mistakes with each of their last two coaching hire transitions. And then they amazingly decided to make them both again this time. So two coaches ago, they let everyone know Ty Lue's their number one choice. Yeah. And then they don't get Ty Lue because they're cheap. And so when they end up getting Frank Vogel, that press conference is a little odd and awkward, as is the hire, because everyone knows he wasn't the top choice. They have now made that mistake again. Also, the, when they fired Frank Vogel, Rob Palenka de, you know, decided, I'm not going to explain it. I'm not going to hold a press, co press conference, which made the press conference when they hired Ham super awkward because there were a lot of, hey, why'd you fire Frank Vogel questions? Well, they made that mistake again, too. So when whomever they hire, that opening press conference, the number one questions are going to be about the guy they really wanted, Danny Hurley, and the number two questions are going to be like, hey, did you give Darvin Ham a fair shot? Meanwhile, J.J. Reddick's going to be sitting there just desperately trying to explain a horn set to us and not get the opportunity. So I just, I don't think they're a well-run franchise, Colin, flatly. So, uh, you know, I, I've said this. I don't know where you've been on this. I, I, I forget. I, you've been critical of Boston through the years. But I did say I predicted Celtics and yeah. six and Jalen Brown would be the MVP. And though he's not as aesthetically pleasing That's or great. as fluid as Jason Tatum, I think this series is once again a reminder that there is a certain aggressiveness alpha that is missing from Tatum. He fills a box score. But he, your number one... Jokic, Ant, Michael, Kobe, Shaq, Barkley. Uh, you got to give me the closer. And when Jalen Brown, I was willing to look past some shooting woes. But when the Mavs drew closer in game two and they went to Jalen for that ceiling bucket, it's like that, that was pretty that was pretty clear. Like I this is the Tatum I've been I think I've talked about that. I think he's a soft one, but a great player. Is this a revelation to you that, like, Brown appears in the last two series to be, like, better? And he talks more in the well, timeouts. So, He's the leader. So, I leader maybe. I don't – I'm not comfortable saying over the totality of a season, like, if, if all the Celtics were free agents and you could add any one of them, I think basically all 30 GMs would pick Tatum before yeah. Brown yeah. because of the talent, because of the size. He is a touch younger. But we now, ha Colin, for guys, it's, this is Tatum just finished his eighth career NBA Finals game. He has the worst field goal percentage in Finals history, the worst of any player who's taken as many shots as he has. I also, I was there a Sunday night in Boston right behind the Mavs bench. He looked unsure of himself, uncertain, and nervous from the opening tip. 
That to me, and even Celtic fans who were giving me hell for picking the Mavs in five, which, you know, I must say it doesn't look like it's going to happen because they've already lost twice. Uh, they weren't defending Tatum. And it is a testament to the roster that Brad Stevens has built, the Derek White trade, Chris Stapps trade, and then Drew Holiday trade, that they are, we are in the midst of Jason Tatum playing some of the worst offensive basketball of his season, and the Celtics are up 2-0. There, there is a lot of, not really stylistically, but as far as egalitarian basketball similarities to the 0-4 Pistons. Now, the 0-4 Pistons were a historic defense, and this is a very good defense, not a historic defense, but... Where you don't know, is it going to be Chauncey? Is it going to be Rip? Is it going to be Sheed? Is it going to be Tayshawn? You don't know where the offense is coming from. You just have an excellent five-man starting rotation. But I think that Jason Tatum has to take something of a hit in these finals because it, and I heard him after the game saying, oh, I'm not going to let my ego get in the way of it. And I appreciate his demeanor. But Jason Tatum took more shots in that game than Luka Doncic did. Yeah. Jason Tatum took 22 shots, and the next highest Celtic was 15. He, it's not like, oh, I don't have it going, I'm just going to defer. He was trying to get it going and couldn't, and he looked very uneasy in the moment. For honestly, that's seven out of eight finals games in his career where he's looked kind of unsure of what he wants to do. So, Caitlin Clark's interesting. I, I, I've, I've made it clear I think she should make the team, but I said there – we're all a little morally flexible. I am. We're all hypocrites. Every politician's a hypocrite. You sign a bill that you don't believe in, but you're trying to get it on another. You know, we, we all know the game. Sure. But there is a certain hypocrisy with the WNBA. For years, they complained about second-class travel. Nobody's paying attention to us. And why don't we make more money? So Caitlin Clark's already solved the attention thing, has helped briefly with the travel, we know at the end of Olympic rosters, it gets subjective and political. But if you're going to complain, if, if, I, if my son complained, he's not there yet, but at 25 he complained, Dad, I don't get any good job offers. And then he did and he said, well, I don't like the hours. I'd say, time out. I heard you complain about that. A lot of what they complained about was attention, travel, and salaries. And like even Mahomes doesn't get everything. Tyreek Hill has to go. Brady took pay cuts. Like, I don't think squeezing Caitlin into the Olympic team is giving up a lot for what she provides, is it? So, well, so this is to me, I very rarely feel, I, I think going both sides on things is typically a cop-out. I think this is a rare instance where I think there is a credible argument on each side of the equation. The credible argument on her not being on the team is a very simple one. As from a merit perspective, she's not one of the 12 best. That it, it, it is not a long argument. It is a simple argument. If we want to put our 12 best out there, she's not there yet. But it is not as simple as that because if we are being fair, from a merit perspective, Diana Taurasi is no longer one of the 12 best, and she has a roster spot. Now, we can say that's leadership, and we can also say, I think correctly, she's earned it. Yeah. She is maybe the greatest women's player of all time. They want to put her in another Olympic. She has identical, all, same points, rebounds, field goal percentage as Caitlin this year. Caitlin turns it over way more, and but also has way more assists. Their, their, their seasons, you put them side by side, it's jarring how similar they are. And you put, you put Diana on, in my opinion, for non-basketball reasons to a degree. You could do the same for Caitlin. Where I am not as worked up as seemingly everyone else is, I actually don't think it was going to... I don't think the eyeballs drawn was going to be so much different with or without Caitlin Clark on the roster because even if she were on the roster, she would not be playing a ton. And where I do think there is some pushback from people who have been longstanding fans or members of the WNBA is, is are people more interested in the WNBA right now than they were? Or are they exclusively and solely interested in Caitlin Clark? Is, was, is, there, 
is, is there an effect of our sport is getting more coverage or is it something, I'm gonna mix metaphors here, of, well, look at how many more people care about the NFL thanks to Taylor Swift. Well, okay, but are they exclusively interested in the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey, or all of a sudden do they have Brock Purdy takes? I don't know, <laughs> and I don't even know if that necessarily matters. But I, I, I don't think the Caitlin Clark topic is, is, is cut and dry in either direction when it comes to the Olympic game. Here is my concern, though, Colin, because we're already seeing it. You have Nikki Haley, who might end up being the next vice president, for all I know, sending out a tweet talking, a base, almost demanding an investigation into why she's not on the <laughs> roster. I think there someone is going to, at a White House press conference, say, does President Biden have a comment on the Caitlin Clark snub? I think this is going to jump over into the political realm because this is so ripe for the culture war craven cretins that just want to, at its core, make this be all oh, this little white girl's getting picked on in a black league. Yeah. And it's going to become really gross in, in ways that Caitlin does not deserve and did not ask for. I also think from a basketball perspective, quickly, I actually think this is really good for Caitlin Clark. And I think the fever in a 12-team league, eight make the playoffs. You don't have to have a great record. Could this month off, plus the fact that the schedule softens, they have no more back-to-backs, lead to Caitlin Clark being excellent late in the season and this team sneaking into the WNBA playoffs, which would be far better for the league than her having a few cameos in the Olympics? I think so, and I actually think that's where this is going to go. Finally, I thought you'd be struck with the irony in this. Oh. Aaron Rodgers made a point. He used profanity. This is unbelievable. Fanity. This is unbelievable. Profanity. Go ahead. I can't wait for this. When he said any of this yeah. blankety blank non football stuff, yeah. get it out of the building. Uh -huh. Yeah, mini camp starts. He's not in the building, he's at a yeah. non football event. It was uh, unexcused absence. Are you struck yeah. with the irony of that? I mean, this is why. So here's the thing. People get very mad at me because all the, they say, when you talk Jets, when you talk Rodgers, can we, I know you don't like some of his stances or you don't agree with him on certain things, but make it about football. You always talk about the other stuff. And my answer is because with this iteration of Aaron Rodgers, the other stuff is inextricably tied to the football to the point to where he double booked mandatory minicamp. Yeah. That's what he did. Double booked. Oh, gosh, darn. I knew there was something June 11th. Oh, what was it? First day of mandatory minicamp. Going to have to miss one. Well, I guess I'm going to miss the football. And it is so, you said all of us have a little bit of hypocrisy to us. This is a, five standard deviations past yeah. what normal people would be okay with from a hypocritical perspective. And the fact that the Jets, I guess, give them credit, finally, for the first time, are standing up for themselves at all with Aaron, saying, no, it's not an excused absence. It is an unexcused absence. And I, I find it galling. And it would not be considered, and, and, he, Normally, I would want to say, well, we don't know the circumstance. Like, if somebody was just missing and it was last minute, it, things happen. People give birth. Someone's in a hospital. I get that. That's clearly not what this is. There were two events being held on June 11th, both of which Aaron Rodgers felt the need to attend, and he chose this other one over the Jets' mandatory minicamp. But, and to do that two weeks after, you talked about how you, you wouldn't be playing if you didn't think you could win the Super Bowl and be league MVP. And three months after, you lectured the whole organization for not having its priorities right for all of it. It's just so disingenuous. It is just so wildly disingenuous and do as I say, not as I do. And I don't know how anyone can think it's going to get better from here for the Jets. Yeah. I don't, the, everyone tried to just pretend the fact that he openly considered running for vice president as well, since he's not doing it, there's nothing to worry about now. 
The fact that that was on the board told you all you needed to know about his level of commitment to this football team at this point in his career. I think it's absolutely pitch perfect that he can't be bothered to attend minicamp. It's just perfect. One of his better appearances. I, I, you know, you straddled the fence on the Olympic thing, but not really. I mean, you had a. I, said, I didn't straddle the fence. Well, Sometimes they're smart. Listen, here's who I think's wrong, Colin. All right. And the, you might, I'm not sure if you fall into this category, right. so I apologize right. if you do. Okay. Anyone that has come out and said that it is a travesty she's not on the team, <laughs> or anyone that has come out and said there is no reason at all for her to be on the team, I think. There is a legitimate argument on both yeah, sides yeah. of it. I just think the Caitlin Clark discourse has gotten so uh, toxic so quickly yeah. that people don't really know how to have the conversation. Yeah. So I've just gave, like you said, what are you, America's honesty broker? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, what am I, America's honesty broker's nephew? <laughs> I'm just trying to carry on that legacy. Yeah, I said the WNBA is the cake of women's basketball. The Olympics is the icing. All cakes are a little better with icing. Uh, but it's not, I'll still eat yeah. the cake. It's still edible. I'm fine. Cup of coffee, you dip the unice cake in. It's fine. You, it's, it's, it's edible. It's better than vegetables. The cake and the coffee? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There you okay. go. All, All right. right. We're, I think we've, we've run our course here. <laughs> we've I'll exhausted this segment. See Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.